I love, I love that you. boy. Lord, you know. Be blessed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Don't you just love that guy? How could you not love him? Would you stand to your feet with me for a moment as we read one verse of Scripture and then we'll fill it in today. You know, we are at the end of our, of our uh, two-month, actually two-month series on Fanning the Flame. You know, I'm so thankful for this church, thankful for your pastor, the staff. I'm thankful that you can come here and feel the fire of God. Somebody say amen. amen. I've been to churches all over the United States. I preach a lot in the United States. Let me tell you, sometimes it takes you probably a couple days just to get them whipped up to understand that there's a fire that you can have. Yeah. Some people just sit there. But, you know, when I come here, I feel the fire of God in your lives. You know, it's easy to feel the fire of God in here, is it not? It's easy to praise and worship when you have praise and worshipers like Pastor, uh, Pastor Larry. Where are you? He's out. All right. Pastor, how could you not praise and worship? He has like a hundred fingers. <laughs> I don't know how he does that, but it's amazing. But what I want to do today, what I want to concentrate on today while you're standing, is I want to concentrate on how you take that fire out to your, your world this week. How you take it, how do you keep that flame burning? And so today I have a message for you called the Anchors That Hold. And as I show this to you, I want to read one verse of scripture, then we'll go and we'll fill it all in from Acts. It's Acts chapter 27, verse 29. But when the 14th, this is Paul talking, when the 14th night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today. I thank you, Lord God, that the flame, the fire that you give us, Lord, is not just resident in a building on Sunday morning, but I'm thankful today, Lord God, that that flame that we need, Lord Jesus, is a flame that we need to take every single day. And today, I pray that we understand the anchors to our salvation, Lord. Without these anchors, Lord, that flame has a, has a tendency, Lord, to just wave and, and, and go out, Lord God. We don't want the flame of our, of our salvation to, to ebb, Lord God. We want to glow brighter and brighter every day. Day. In the midst of the storms, Lord, we want to know that the flame is still there and that we have an anchor that holds. I pray today, Lord, you bless our word, Lord God, bless the reading of it, the preaching of it, Lord God, and the hearing. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. So, I took a vacation. Now, I've gone pretty much a lot of places uh, in my lifetime. Thank God he's given me the opportunity, Cheryl and I. But we, we took a trip to Niagara Falls. How many have ever been to Niagara Falls? How many have never been to Niagara Falls? You need to go to Niagara Falls. Of all the places I've been, this is the place I keep going back to. I just really enjoy going to Niagara Falls. It's absolutely amazing. So Cheryl and I took several friends with us, and uh, again, one of our favorite places to visit. We've been there quite a few times, and you can't get away from its grandeur and its beauty. It's extremely impressive, especially the Horseshoe Falls on the Canadian side of the visit. So you'll see the Maid of the Mist that goes up into the falls, which we've done, and it pushes you back down. We actually went underneath it, and it's always a rainbow that's there uh, when the sun's out because of the angle of the water hitting the raindrops that are there or the mist that's coming out. Uh, they light it up at night and it can be amazing but we sometimes we'll stand right at the edge and watch it. They light it up at night. They've been doing it since 1925 and it's absolutely amazing the glow that is there. You just you can feel God's presence when you see. You can feel his hand of, of his creative hand as it's there. Now Niagara Falls is amazing for a lot of reasons. I like to get some of the statistics for it. It's 2,600 feet long, almost nine football fields end to end. It's 100 to 200 feet high. That's 20 stories. It's 100,000 gallons of water goes over it every single second. Water weighs about 8 pounds for a, a gallon. So that's about 2,832 tons of water per second. It's located in between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. The rapids above the falls travel at 25 miles an hour. Then they increase till they reach the falls as it narrows down into a kind of gorge. Themselves record, uh, record speeds of those rapids at the falls is a whopping 68 miles per hour. And anyone caught upstream, unfortunately, who comes out of their boat or drifts down is headed towards the falls and sure death. One-fifth of all the fresh water in the world lies in the four upper Great Lakes. Michigan, Huron, Superior, and Erie. Matter of fact, they cascade. They have locks that bring them down as they make their way to the sea. And then after Erie, you have the Niagara River, which also brings the water down to the next lake, which is Ontario. And then they go to the Atlantic Ocean through the St. Lawrence Seaway. But what really fascinates me and thrills me are the thrill seekers who dare to go over the falls voluntarily in all types of contraptions. Now, I'm going to show you some of them, and I have to admit something to you. I'm not always the smartest uh, cookie in the box. Amen. When I, <laughs> I knew I can count on an amen from him. When I first saw this falls, I have to admit to you that I wanted to go over them. I know that sounds strange, but uh, it definitely did to Cheryl. As a matter of fact, when I took this trip, we told our children we were going, and all of them said independently, make sure dad doesn't go over the falls. 
It fascinates me. They have a museum up there. It's called the Daredevil Museum. It's uh, Daring the Devil, but actually it's not Daring the Devil at all. They're just thrill seekers. The very first one was a 63-year-old teacher who was tired of her kids making fun of her. In 1901, she got in a barrel with a mattress and went over the falls, and she survived, amazingly enough. But it continues. Her name was uh, Annie Eason Taylor. There have been 15 people who voluntarily have gone over those falls since 1901. Seven of them have died. Some survived, uh, like Barney, uh, Bobby Leach in 1911, who broke both kneecaps and a jaw, yet survived. But a year later, he slipped on an orange pe peel and died from complications. I'm not sure. I guess when your time's up, your time's up. Then there's this guy. This is Charles Stevens in 1920. He went over and he equipped his barrel with an anvil anchor for security tied to his ankles. After the plunge, his right arm was the only thing left in the barrel. I know. Then they've gone over with all kinds of contraptions, all kinds of metal balls and iron balls and all kinds of rubber, all kinds of uh, metal cylinders that they've gone over. The museum shows it all. And then this guy, I don't know what he was thinking, went over in inner tubes, inner tubes, just wrapped himself in a bunch of inner tubes. He immediately died. So even recently, 1995, this man went over from, he's a 39-year-old from California, and he decided to take a jet ski over the falls. That's a picture of him going over it. And he has a rocket in a parachute. So his idea was that he's going to get right over the falls, and then right when he's over off of his jet ski over the falls, he's going to blow that rocket and shoot that parachute out. Unfortunately, he forgot that water quenches fire. And the water took his, his uh, rocket and it didn't ignite, and he went to his death. But the sad part is that, on average, 40 people die every year when they're swept over these falls, every single year. 12 to 18 are from suicides. Interestingly enough, a casino is about 1,000 yards up from the falls, and men and women who lose everything in the casino gambling will actually plunge into the fall to kill themselves. So 12 to 18 are from suicides. The rest are accidents, like the 19-year-old girl who stood on the rail of the falls to get her picture taken, which is forbidden. She stood over the falls, and she was a 90-pounder, is what they said, and she opened her umbrella. And as she opened her umbrella, a gust from the falls took her over into the falls before she could leave go of her umbrella, and she died. You know, I thought about her, and I thought about the man who strapped an anchor to his ankles. If only she had an anchor that day, it would have prevented her from going over the rails to her death. And then I thought about us and the spiritual anchors that we have that keep us from going over the rails of life. How many of you know that there are some, tra there are some dangerous spots in life? There are spots that we find ourselves in, traumas that we find ourselves in, problems, worries, depressive moods, and sometimes it, it almost threatens to take us over the falls. And I thought about, what are our spiritual anchors? Do we have any spiritual anchors? And God led me to really a study that I did from Acts, and I took that study and redid it into a message for you today. The last part of Acts chapter 27 is about a shipwreck. And if you understand and read it, you'll find out about Paul, and he is in this shipwreck in the last vo voyage of his life. A little backdrop. Paul has taken three missionary trips. He has spent a good t deal of his adult life, his adult life over 30, traveling for the gospel and planting churches. In his travels, he traveled over 11,000 miles. That's without a car. That's without trains or planes. That's on foot and on, and, on uh, ships. This one is he's traveling to Rome. This is his last, last voyage. He's traveling to Rome because he's appealed to Caesar. And so Caesar will go, we will read later that a centurion will be in charge of him with a hundred sol shoulder, soldiers on a ship. They actually take a ship that's headed to Rome from Alexandria, Egypt. That ship has wheat on it. It's going to Rome just like many other wheat ships would go there because the Romans, the Roman Senate has decided to feed every single one of its citizens bread every single day. So the trade route back and forth of that wheat is, imme is immense. We also know the owner of that ship is on, on board. Now, as he goes through, he's traveling, and this is a fateful voyage uh, that's going to happen before he gets to Caesar. The ship is headed for disaster. Let me read the full text for you this morning as I give you some background before I preach. So you'll see in Acts chapter 27, verse 27, it says, When the found 14th night, our text, was come, as we were driven up and down the, in Adria, Adriatic, about midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. And they sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. Then, fearing this, we have fallen upon rocks. They cast four anchors, there's where my message comes from, out of the stern and wished for the day. It continues and says this, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, stay in the ship, you will not be saved. 
Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. That is the dinghy that's, that's there, the uh, lifeboat. Paul besought them to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that you have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat. And we were in all in the ship, 203 score and 16 souls, 276 people. A hundred of those were armed guards. Roman centurion is over them. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea, so they let go of their cargo. Now, Paul has taken these journeys, and now we see him, we see him in dire straits. Just put yourself there on that ship that day. Put yourself in, in the, Paul's place. The ship is ready to be, to be uh, totally destroyed. Paul and his shipmates are literally in dire straits. How many of you ever heard that term? Dire straits on their way to, to Rome. Let me show you what that means. Have you ever, before I do, have you ever been in dire straits? Somebody raise your hand. Let me give you one more thing from, the, from Niagara Falls. So, one of the people who survived Niagara Falls without anything, going over just with a, a life jacket, was a little boy of seven years old. In 1961, he was in a boat with a friend, an adult friend and his sister. They were fishing up in the Niagara River above the falls. Well, the, the motor failed, and he tried the, the friend tried to keep starting the, the, the motor, but unfortunately, they had drifted so far, the rapids had taken them so far that they were, they were very close to the falls, and they were going to go over. The uh, the uh, his sister actually managed to swim to one of the sides and they reached out and grabbed her six feet before she was going to go over the falls. The man went over the falls and he died. The little boy went over the falls and he lived. He's the only one, they call it the miracle of Niagara. He's the only one to ever live going over with nothing. The maid of the mist picked him up when they saw him. You know, I did a little research on him. His name is uh, Roger uh, Wood, uh, Woodward. He lives, I, I was amazed to find this out. I was reading it up in, uh, on the internet when I was up in Niagara Falls. He lives in Huntsville, Alabama. And he's a born-again Christian. And he goes around telling people about the miracle of Niagara. How many of you believe that you are here because of a miracle of God? How many believe it's God's divine plan for you to be here today? How many believe that God can speak directly to your spirit today? How many believe that the word of God does not go out void, but it comes back to, and sets itself and comes back to accomplish what it's supposed to accomplish? Somebody say amen. So that means you're in the right place today. That means you are in the right spot today because God has actually ordained you to be here. This is a divine appointment for you to be in this church. It's a divine appointment for you to hear this message, as well as if you're here last week and heard pastor's message or next week, because God has you to hear something to change your life. Come on, somebody say amen. Amen. So, the etymology or the, the root of the word uh, dire straits, straight is a Middle English word from Latin strictus, meaning to bind tightly. And that's exactly what the Niagara River does. It gets very, very narrow, and that's why there's such a power going over those falls as all that water comes from four great lakes. It was used by sailors to describe a narrow or tight, difficult to maneuver channel of water, such as the Straits of Gibraltar or the Bering Strait. Dire also has a Latin root and means terrible or fearsome. So let me ask the question again. Have you ever got up into a situation in life where you felt you were being squeezed in? Have you ever gotten into a situation in life where you felt like it was dire straits, that if something didn't happen, you're not sure what's going to go on? You're not sure if you're going to make it? Listen, Paul is literally, is literally traveling with his companions in dire straits. Uh, that dire straits, the voyage has been very difficult. It's been, it's been coming all the way from over here on the, e on the west, and he's traveling all the way. Notice that little, that little island, Malta. But if you really kind of stop right about here, this Sirtis Major, you'll understand where they've been blown off. A great storm is coming, the Euroclidon. It's a wind that comes from the east. It's blown them off this course, and they're right down here. They're right over here in this Sirtis Major. Now, they know very well what that is. They know that the, uh, the winds are coming as it takes six months and 2,000 miles to travel here. They know that the winds are coming, and basically it's going to blow them into the Sirtis Major sandbar. And it is a sandbar. It's way out in the Mediterranean Ocean. It's below the Ionian Sea where it meets the Mediterranean off the coast of what we now know as Libya and Africa. So the fear, Luke tells us, is of is the possibility of being shipwrecked on the Sirtis Sands. The Sirtis Sands are right there. Now, if you looked at it, if you looked at it in a topographical map of the base of the, uh, of the floor of the ocean, you'll see that the Sirtis Sands have these high rises that come in here, and they've shipwrecked people for thousands of years. They know that there's lots of wrecks there. They know that when they're blown into there, that they're going to be torn apart. They know the wreckage that is there. They know how bad it is. They understand it. The dire straits, they need to cross this treacherous part of the sea that is littered with, with uh, shipwrecks from long ago. Listen, any counselor or pastor who has ever counseled or cared about people and families can list a host of shipwrecked lives looking for, desperately looking for, and seeking a way out of their present troubles. 
We find Paul saying to this, the fearful sailors and owner and the centurion of the ship. Now again, let me set the mindset. I'm just giving you a little backdrop. I'm not preaching yet. You know how you can tell I'm preaching? I sling sweat. So I'm not slinging any sweat yet, so I'm not preaching. Let me give you a little backdrop. So they have Paul. They actually are going to tie him to the mast at several points because he's their prisoner. If they miss him, if he's gone, if he escapes, every single Roman soldier will be killed. The centurion will be killed. There's other people on the ship probably to have to do with the ship owner and unloading the cargo once they get there. And so it's, it's pretty amazing to me that Paul is going to take over. Now understand that there's, there's a whole bunch of, of legal, authoritarian soldiers that are there. Now watch what happens with Paul, what, what Paul says. He says, Last night there appeared beside me an angel of, the, of God to whom I belong and whom I serve. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You are destined to appear before Caesar, and God grants you the safety of all who are sailing with you. Again, I'm telling you this story, Acts 27, 25. Therefore, take heart, men, Paul talking, for I believe, God, that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. Now, the life lessons are absolutely evident for us. It's about the journey of life. Our life is a journey through time into eternity. We all have a beginning and an end, uh, which are separated by the experiences of life along the way. You can go to any cemetery today and you'll see, a, a, you'll see a beginning date of someone who's born. Then you'll see a dash. Then you'll see the ending date. That dash represents a life. That dash represents all the trials of life. It represents all the joys of life. It represents something that's, uh, that's encapsulated in just one little dash, hardly evident to be able to share what a life is. But all of us have experiences in life. Yours are different than mine. Mine are different than yours. Your problems will be different than mine. And it amazes me sometimes. It amazes me as pastors and counselors will come up and be able to preach. We think sometimes that they have no problems or that they never go through anything. We are you. Somebody say amen. We go through the exact same things you go through. We need this word as much as anybody else needs it. Amen. The life lessons are evident. We can see from that that at this point, not the captain, and it's amazing to me, or the crew, or even the centurion is in total control of the, tri of the destiny. Making all of the decisions is Paul, which brings me to my message this morning. Anchors that hold. Acts 27, again, 27 to 29. I know we're repeating it, but just listen. So it says, Where, When the 14th night has come, as we are being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, notice it's dark, it's night, the sailors suspect that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found 20 fathoms a little further, and they took a sounding again and found 15 fathoms. And fearing that they might run on the rocks, they let down the four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. Now watch what he's doing. The storm seems to be over, but the ship has been tossed and torn for 14 nights. They are battered. They are beaten. The sailors are looking like rag dolls on top of the ship. And so basically, they're still not out of danger. All they want to do right now is make it through the Adriatic Sea. That's all they want to do. Notice the word says that they took soundings and they found it to be 20 fathoms. A soundings were made with a line that had lead on the end of it so it would sink. And then at the rope, uh, it would have knots, tied leather knots up at 2 feet and 4 feet and 10 feet and 20 feet. Those were, those were the, the soundings that they would make to see the depth. A fathom is six, feet, is 6 feet in length. So basically, almost every one of us, our arm length stretched out is the exact same as our height. And so all they had to do is take the, take the rope and stretch it out and they'd know a fathom. And so they're sounding fathoms. They're wondering whether they're getting very close to running aground and their death. And let me just tell you a little side note. Samuel Clemens, you better know him as Mark Twain. Mark Twain got his name because he was a boy. He would go on the Mississippi River on the boats and he would mark, he would put marks on rope, Twain. Two of them, which would be two fathoms, would be 12 feet, safe traveling distance, uh, safe traveling for the Mississippi River. Here in Paul's day, they sounded 12 20 fathoms. 20 times 6 is 120 feet. Then 15 brings them down to 90 feet. Then they get down to 30 feet. It's getting closer and closer the bottom is. And they would run aground. And I'm intrigued by what verse 29 says. They dropped four anchors. Now who cares? Why would we have four anchors there? Why do, why was it, why do we even have to know that? Because every word of Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Every word wants to speak to us. It's four anchors because God has a message in this. He has something to tell us about an anchoring of our soul. And so I want to bring you to those four anchors today. It's why, and, and why he tells us why these anchors were dropped. Have you ever prayed for the day to come? It says they dropped the anchors and they prayed the day come. Come on, somebody say amen. Let me tell you where your biggest problems come. Your biggest problems 
Christians and mine and pastors come in the night. It's in the night season where your mind goes crazy. It's in the night season where the enemy dwells. He gets you up in the middle of the night. He puts something on your mind and you can't sleep. You get up and you're not sure what to do. You're nervous because you're thinking of a problem. Come on. How many are with me today? It's the night season. The, the enemy loves to travel in the night. He loves to torment us in our thoughts. Let me tell you something. Torturing us every single night, some of us, that you can't sleep because you're thinking of the problems. Isn't it amazing how when you wake up in the day, it seems like they're not as bad as when you were in the night? Yeah. But that's what he's doing. He's running around the night trying to get you so messed up, trying to go on your mind. Your mind is a battleground. And he goes there at night to try to, to, try to wrestle you down in everything you have and everything you believe in. It's in the night hours that worry and fear stalks its prey. Satan many times stalks us in the night. We've all known restless nights when sleep eludes us and our minds multiply our problems, conjuring them into larger, more grotesque monsters than they really are. What can we do to make it through the night? What Paul and the sailors did, notice it says at midnight. Again, why need that, why need that little detail? Because God, through the Holy Spirit, wants us to learn a lesson here. It's at the darkest hour. And let me tell you, night isn't just because of the moon or the, or the earth traveling around the sun. Night can happen any time in your life. You can be given something that's, that makes you feel so dark. It makes you feel like nothing's going to happen and you can't see light. It's an image for us. How for us to make it through the night. When they sensed they were drawing near to some land, they sounded the depth. First 20 fathoms, then 15. The fear of going over the rocks was very real. To slow the drift until morning, they let out four anchors and they prayed for the day to come. Man, I read that and I think about how indicative that is of many of our lives. Verse 29 provides an excellent basis for us communicating what to do in the dark nights of the soul, as well during any night of sleepless anxiety. So don't miss this morning because Luke is drawing us into a spiritual truth of what to do when you fear your ship is about to hit the rocks. When that lump you feel, ladies, is diagnosed as cancer. When you realize that your shortness of breath is a serious heart matter. When your boss tells you that the company is downsizing and he has to let you go. When you face disappointment from a wayward son or daughter. When you, when you, can, when you have more bills left in your months. When you're over the rails and you feel the pull on your umbrella. Listen, we've all been there. Some of you are there right now. We've all been there when we don't know what to do in a crisis. Yes, you're Christian. Yes, you love God. Yes, you understand Jesus. Yes, you understand going to church. Yes, you put your trust in Him. But still, the night comes. Still, you have those problems still it weighs on your mind you wonder is this a good investment I made is this something that's going to turn out for my good and yes you understand the things of being a Christian but still the night picks at you and the night gnaws at you and basically it's something that you want to be able to say man I need the day to come I need something to help me which brings me to my first anchor let me share these first anchors now these are words that you know but I really want to let you know them really well today matter of fact if you have a pen I would suggest that you write these four words down in your Bible because this is really the foundation that's going to keep your faith strong. You want the fire to grow and you want the fire to stay, stay alive in you, you're going to need these four words. The first anchor is faith. Now, I know what you're saying. I know all about faith. No, we don't really know all about faith. Faith is two things in Scripture. It is a fruit of the Spirit. You can gain it every day. Matter of fact, by reading the Word today to you, you're gaining faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Secondly, it's a manifestation of, this, of the Spirit, one of the gifts. The only thing that's both a fruit and a gift. And so you and I need that extraordinary faith in times of trouble. We need that faith that's going to reach out and calm us. That faith that's going to reach out and settle us. Come on, how many are with me today? Somebody say amen. All right, now listen to me because I want to tell you a little bit about this word faith. I actually did this. I actually put them down on some, on some little pieces of wood. And I made them small because of your people in the back. Because next week you may say, Mabel, that was too small. We need to move up a little bit. <laughs> Let me repeat that. Mabel, that was too small. We need to move up a little bit. <laughs> faith. What is faith? Faith is an interesting word. We hear a lot of teaching about it, but I want to give you it as an anchor today. Not just as a word, but something you can anchor your soul to. Something that will never change in your life. When I'm in the darkness, I repeat all the, word, all the names of God that I know in Scripture. And I know a lot of them. Listen, there's 975 names for God in Scripture. 975. What the Bible is, is not a, it's not a treatise to show us history. It's not to prove the astronomy. It's a, it's a revelation of God the man. As we start to read the Bible, you'll find out that some people didn't know him 
name is Jehovah. He keeps giving us one name after another after another. He gives us all the way down the line so you can have an intimacy with God. When I first met Cheryl, I said to somebody, hey, who's that cute girl? I was not saved. I actually said cute chick. Who's that cute chick? And somebody said, Cheryl Hoke. I said, oh, Cheryl Hoke. So when I went up to her, which I was brave enough to do, I said, hey, Cheryl, I'm Mark, which she probably said, okay. And then, uh, then I, as we got to know each other, I started to call her by the name their family called her, Cher. And now I call her Sweetheart and other names I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> it's an intimacy. It gets you closer and closer and closer and closer. That's what God wants to do with His Word. I don't know how you can experience God without reading His Word. Reading His Word gets you to understand an intimacy with Him. You'll hear these names, and I, I think of them when I'm in trouble. I think of them when my mind is going a certain way. And let me tell you something. These are some of my favorite ones right in here. The unique names of God. Yahweh, Makadesh. It means the Lord who sanctifies and makes holy. You are holy because of Jesus Christ. No matter what the devil tells you, you are holy. You are spotless. You are blameless. You may put yourself down. You may say, man, I'm a sinner. But you are holy because Christ stands between you and your sin towards God. Come on, somebody say amen. It's the Yahweh, the Lord. You've got to be Lord over all, or he's not Lord all at all. El Shaddai, the mighty one of Jacob. Let me suggest he's also the mighty one of you. El Roy, God is seeing. The Lord sees everything you're going through. He understands what happens at night. He understands the tortures of the mind. Yahweh Sig Kanu, the Lord our righteousness. I like that one. El Olam, I'll tell you about it in a moment. Everlasting God. Look, the Lord our banner, the Lord our shepherd, the Lord who heals. God, creator, mighty strong. God, mighty strong, prominent. El Eloha, Shalom. The Lord our peace, Adonai, Lord, El Gibor. I love that one also. It's mighty God, one of the ancient names for God. Let me tell you about El Olam. How many artists do we have in here? How many have you ever painted or, or drew? How many of you have arms? <laughs> Raise them up. All right, if you have, listen, if you've painted or if you've drawn something, many times to, to show distance, you will start two parallel lines and you'll start to bring them closer and closer and closer so you can show a distance like a train. You'll see the first part of the train large and then it'll taper off and narrow. It shows you the past of that train. Let me tell you what that word says. El Olam means that God is the God of yesterday. As far back as you see, God is there. You can't outpace Him in the past. And God is the God of tomorrow. He's there tomorrow. He's waiting for you tomorrow. He he already has it taken care of. Whatever you're going through, he's already there. He's already watching. He's already waiting. He knows who you are. The El Olam. It's my God and it's your God. El Olam. Listen, I think about the names. I think about when I, when I have trouble of mind or when I have some problem. I think about the names of God. I don't think about my problem. Come on. It's very important for us to understand God trumps your problem. It has nothing to do with our president. He trumps your problem. He's always won over your problems. Somebody say amen. He's always there. You don't know how you're going to make it through it? Well, God's there waiting for you because you're going to make it through it. Come on, somebody say amen today. Amen. Now listen, as we go further with this faith anchor. So, I, uh, the names are amazing, absolutely amazing. Let me give you just two of the most unusual names for Jesus in Scripture. They're Messianic promises, and I promise you, you've never heard these names before. The first one, is the owl among the runes. The owl among the runes. Where do I get that from? Well, Psalm 102, verse 6. Notice there's two birds here. I am like a pelican. This is a messianic promise. It's in the first person. I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. An owl of the desert. One translation is an owl in the runes. It's also for us. The runes, St. Augustine writes, also represent Christians who have been devastated by the movings of actions of the night. That's what he writes. Owls are active in the night. Listen, the enemy may be going at you at night, but God is there as the owl of the wilderness. He's there to cover you even in the night. When I get up at night and something's troubling me, I call on Jesus. I can feel him fly into my room. I can feel that room in the presence of God. And let me tell you something, I can go right back to sleep. You know why? Because the owl in the wilderness is there. He comes in to comfort for me. Come on, somebody say amen. The owl in the wilderness. You didn't know that. How about this one? A pelican. The Bible says, don't miss it. It says it's a pelican. Owls in Jesus' day, by the way, in the psalmist's days, inhabited the runes. But notice it also says a pelican in the wilderness. Another reference to Messiah. Listen to what it says. The pelican was believed to pierce its own breast with its beak and feed its young its blood. It became a symbol of Christ sacrificing himself for man. And because of this was frequently represented in Christian art in addition to the Dalmatian pelican's pouch that held its young. So the pelican is known to do that. So when we take people to the, to the, uh, to the upper room in, uh, in art form from 1100 AD, the Crusaders carved a pelican and they carved it 
pulling something out of its heart and feeding its children. Every time I'm there, people ask me what it is and everybody else gathers around because they don't know. And I tell them it's a symbol of Christ. He will pierce his own heart and feed you the blood yeah. so that you can survive. You are blood bought. You are on the blood of Jesus Christ. Your very life existence is because of the blood of Jesus Christ. The pelican, the blood of Jesus Christ feeds his children. And when you get in trouble, he will hide you inside himself. Oh, come on. This is a name for Jesus. This is your God. This is my God. This is what he does when you're in trouble. Somebody say amen. amen. Today, I want to give you just a basic so that you can understand how your faith must grow. I want you to understand what's going on here. The pelican, the owl, you can see the, you can see the image in art. If these names don't increase your faith, this word will. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The same word that I'm preaching to you right now. Look, we all have faith. Romans 12.3 says that to everyone, God has given a measure of faith. Even to the saved and the unsaved. The unsaved have faith. You want me to prove it to you? Bigfoot? Really? You believe in Bigfoot? How about the abominable snowman or the yeti? That's different names for, for Bigfoot, Bigfoot. How about the Loch Ness Monster? They believe in the Loch Ness Monster? It takes faith to believe in the Loch Ness Monster. How about aliens hidden in Area 51? There's a million people that want to march on Area 51 today. I got news for them. There's no aliens there. You're going to find the government with guns. There's no aliens. How do I know that? Because science tells us that. CT, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Large radio, large radio telescopes have been dotting their, our planet since 1980. And scientists and NASA have set them up. They're all over the place, from Australia, America, New Zealand, or in Europe. And they're looking in outer space. You see, the thing with outer space is if a sound is made in outer space, it keeps traveling. And so if there's aliens out there, they should be making a sound. In 39 years, not one single peep from space. We are here alone. You know why I know that? Because you are the beginning of God's creation. We're very, we're very close, and this may sound strange to you, but we're very close to when God created Adam in that first day. We're very close to the garden. How do I know that? Because he created all these planets for a reason. He created the vastness of space for a reason. How do you think they're going to be filled up? The first command was be fruitful and multiply. Then what? Well, if you multiply after the thousand year millennium, God's going to fill the universe with people, mortals. But you are not a mortal. You are immortal. You will never die die. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. God's going to use you to rule and reign. Oh, come on. No wonder why the enemy goes at us every single day because he knows your potential. He knows it's going to go on. Look at Revelation. Look at the thousand year millennium. He tempts them once. Why would you tempt somebody once in a thousand years? Because they will never rule and reign. You and I are going to fill the universe with people that God allows us to, allows us to rule over. I know that's really head, heady and you can't wrap your mind around it. You don't have to. Because I'm not talking about that today. <laughs> I'm talking about faith. You've got to get through every day. We're never going to get to the other spot God has intended for us if we don't understand we have a, need an anchor of faith. Somebody say amen. amen. They all have faith, even the unsaved. In Allah? Allah's a moon god. One of 400 pagan gods that Muhammad was convinced to elevate to one God. Allah, Buddha? Come on. Are you kidding me? Confucius? The name should tell you a whole lot. Faith. The other night, God woke me up with an acronym for faith. I like it. Finally accepting invisible th that invisible things happen. Finally accepting that invisible things happen. Finally accepting that invisible things happen. Let me tell you how that, how that works out. We all think about faith, but do you really believe that things that haven't happened yet will happen? No matter what the situation is, no matter what the circumstances are, do you believe that your faith is going to see it in your faith before it happens? You know, a lot of people say um, seeing is believing. That's the opposite of faith. Believing is seeing. Unless you believe it, it may not happen. 
Why do you think Jesus went around and said, no greater faith as I found in this. By your faith are you healed. By your faith, I have, I've seen, I'm not seen great faith like this. And if you say to this mountain, be thou removed, it'll be removed. If you have the faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can say, mountain, be gone. He's talking about something saying, I haven't seen it yet, but I believe you may be in a trouble today. You may have some sickness today. You may have something that's going wrong in your body. Let me tell you something. I believe in doctors. When my car's sick, I take my car to a mechanic. They know more than I do. I believe in doctors. I'll take my body to a doctor, but a doctor cannot heal you. There's not a doctor on the planet that can heal you. All they can do is administer to your problems. But we have a great physician, Jesus Christ. If you have faith in him, don't ever go to a doctor without praying. Don't ever go to an, or under an operation without praying. I ask doctors, if I'm going to go under an operation, would you pray with me? If they're not going to pray with me, I'm not getting operated on. Now that may be radical for you, but I believe Finally accepting the invisible, that invisible things happen. What are you praying for today? Do you really believe it will happen? Yeah. Or is it just kind of like a shot in the air? You know, I've done everything else, and so now I'm going to shoot it in the air and see if it happens. No, faith is really believing it's going to happen in spite of you not seeing it. Come on, someone say amen to that. Amen. Those thrill seekers who are going over Niagara Falls, they have faith. They have faith in metal balls to take him over and make him live. In rubber inner tubes? What was he thinking? And I don't know what happened to my voice there. <laughs> what was he thinking? Think about the great faith he had to have. If I, put, if I put nine rubber inner tubes around you and told you I was going to put you over the falls, you're going to have to have some faith. Think of it. You have to have faith. Let me tell you why. Jesus is the author and a finisher of our faith. There's a big difference there than just being the author. He's the author of everyone's faith, but they don't use it. You can use it. He's the finisher of your faith, which means he'll bring you through whatever you're going, whatever you're going through right now. You will be healed physically, whether you can feel it or not. You will, make, you will mend that marriage, whether you can feel it or not. Your child will come back to the Lord, and whether you see it or not in your lifetime, your family will live in peace. You will make it through the, through the, uh, the shipwreck. Come on, you've got to believe if God's going to do it, then don't think that wayward child's out there forever. Just because you see him getting worse and worse and worse and worse. You gotta believe by faith that God's gonna rescue your family. You gotta believe what the world what the word says that oh you and your household, you gotta believe that God can heal a body. I'm standing here today telling you that God can heal a body. He's sitting there today telling you that God can heal a body. Whether it's your heart or whether it's cancer from your neck down, God can heal you. Come on, somebody say amen. <laughs> Oh, but pastor, there were other people that prayed and they died. You know why? Because death is ultimate healing. Right. It's ultimate healing. Paul said, I can live for me to live is gain, to die is Christ. Yeah. And so it doesn't matter life or death, but as long as you have breath and you have life, you pray and you believe by faith that God can touch you. Right. You know how many churches don't believe that today? You know how many churches just sit there and look at pastors and the pastor tiptoes around healing verses? No, you got to be believe in healing. Otherwise, you have no faith. Listen, Paul tells those on that creaking ship with ropes that are snapping and sails that are tearing apart, masts that are breaking and the wooden sides coming off, stay on the ship. No lives will be lost. Listen, second one, hope. Hope. We think we know what this is. I'm not so sure. Hope isn't, oh, I hope that works out for me. Like, it may or may not. That's not spiritual hope. Hope is assurance. The blessed hope. It's an assurance. One of these days, Jesus Christ is going to break the eastern sky. There's going to be a trumpet sound. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up so forever to be with the Lord in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4. You know what? I don't. And Paul says, comfort one another with these words. He says, this is your hope, the blessed hope. I don't believe in maybe he'll come back. I don't believe in, well, I wonder if somebody wrote it the wrong way. I believe that Jesus is actually going to come back. It's my hope today. One of these days he's going to come back. If you haven't noticed it yet, our world is not getting any better. Listen, I have grandchildren. I concern myself for the world they live in. In because our world is going on a downhill slide. But one of these days, Jesus is going to come back. He's going to break the eastern sky. And before you have an opportunity to die, before you go down, by the way, the Bible says that no corruption can inherit incorruption. It means you'll have to die before the rapture. Let me tell you how I think it's going to happen. The dead in Christ will rise first. Their spirits are already there. Their bodies will come and, and, and meet their spirits in the air. Then you and I, if we're alive, our bodies will die. But before they get to the ground, our spirits will come up over it and you will go rapture to the God. Let me tell you something. You and I are the raptured of God. That word means
means harpoon. I'm going to harpoon my church. I'm going to take them out of the world. It's coming, friends. I don't care if people believe it or they don't believe it. It's our blessed hope. It is coming. Hope. What does it mean for us today? What does that word tell us? How can we anchor in that word? If I said it once in teaching, I said it a hundred times. Man can live 40 days without food. He can live three days without water. He can live five minutes without air. But you can't live a second without hope. Those Niagara Fall thrill seekers hoped they would make it safely to the other side, to the bottom, as they use their faith in trusting their vessels. Oh, come on. It's an amazing analogy. Those men on Paul's ship hope that Paul's right. They hope that the words of Paul, they'll make it out alive. Swiss theologian Emil Brunner in 1888, when facing atheists and critics who stated that Jesus was merely a just man, but not God incarnate, said this, what oxygen is to the lungs, such is hope to the meaning of life. Pastor's been there. Pastor Terry's been there at the bedside of people who are dying. The doctors came in. Remember the feeling in the room? The oppression that came in? Remember the doctor said they're on ventilators and they may not make it? Remember that, that just crowded feeling that everything seemed like getting dark from the edges and coming in? If you didn't feel it, you could feel it on the families. On the families. And they ask us questions. What should I do, Pastor? What should I do? I always tell them the same thing. It is, it is appointed unto man once to die. Think about that guy who slipped on the orange peel. God had his number. And listen to this. I tell them as long as there's breath in life, you pray. They say, well, I'm not, I'm not sure if I should take them off the machines. I say, if you take them off the machines, I've seen people taken off machines and live. I've seen people put on machines and die. Life and death is in the hands of God. No one else. So I tell them, as long as there's breath, as long as there's life, you hope. I went to see my brother suffering from ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And I walked in that room and I could see him. I, I've been talking to him on the phone for about three months and he sounded like he was drunk. He couldn't speak pronounce his words and I thought and they didn't diagnose it was ALS which is devastating by the way I walked in there and all his family was just so down all my nieces and my nephews and I I could bring them something I can't tell them God's going to do this or God's going to do that but I can bring them hope I could step in that room and you could tell I'd look in their eyes and say listen I led him to the Lord I said he's in God's hands and I could see the whole darkness just to go out of that room I saw them take a breath it was better than a ventilating machine. He died about a week later. Let me tell you something. Where would you be without hope? Where would you be without hope? Dead. Where would you be without hope? Dead. Lost. Hope. It doesn't stop. Hope is something you have to anchor. An anchor ca catches on a rock and you don't move. It amazes me that they throw out anchors when a ship is tearing apart. You'd think they'd let it go. But no, Paul says, let out the anchors. And they're staying there and it almost looks like they're getting rocked and, and ripped apart even more. Let me tell you something. God doesn't tell you that you'll never go through anything. He says that he'll go through it with you. Somebody say amen. amen. To me, hope is this. It's a combination of the faithfulness of the Lord and the perfect timed invasion of his spirit into the affairs of our lives. God knows who are his. He has a plan for you, a purpose to give you an expected end, Je Jeremiah tells us. Listen, this scripture is in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. I want you to understand it one more time. The anchor of the soul, the anchor of the soul. A little over a month before he died, the famous atheist and existentialist Jean Paul Sartre declared that he so strongly resisted feelings of despair that he would say to himself, I know I shall die in hope. Then in profound sadness he would add, but hope needs a foundation. Do you know what we're built on? We're built on the blood of Jesus Christ. We are built on that cross. We are built on the deaths of the apostles. We are built on thousands and millions of men and women, men that have gone to the, to the Circus Maximus in, the, in Rome, in the, in the Colosseum, and, and saw lions tear apart their children. You're built on that. You're directly related to that. You are built on the blood of the martyrs. You are built on the blood of Christ. You have a secure hope. You have a hope that if you die, you'll live again. You have a hope that no matter what you go through in life, God's going to be there with you. You have a hope. Don't tell me you can't take it. Of course you can take it because you're not the only one to go 
through it. And God's saying, if I'm with you, who can be against you? You have a hope. Anchor your hope in Jesus Christ today. No matter what you're going through, put that anchor on and say, God, I'm not moving. It doesn't matter if my ship gets wrecked. It doesn't matter if I'm flying apart at the seams. I'm not moving. I trust you. I trust everything that you want for my life. That's hope. That's real hope. The third anchor. And by the way, I want you to understand that people have misguided hope before I get to the third anchor. Let me give you an example. The hymn is right. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. So what are you hoping for today? Your investments in your 401k in the stock market to grow bigger and bigger? Well, good luck with that. How about the Democrats stop, will stop hounding our president? Yeah, right. How about the whole world would become a global Disneyland with everyone singing Kumbaya and Michael rode the boat ashore and we'll have peace forevermore. It ain't going to happen. David used the word hope over 30 times in Scripture. For thou, O Lord, art my hope. Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, bearing all things, believing all things, hoping in all things, enduring all things. Come on, tell your neighbor you're going to make it. <laughs> oh, come on, be more convincing than that. Be a priest, be an evangelist and tell him. Tell him like in an evangelist, in an evangelist statement. You're going to make it. Come on, tell him. <laughs> Third anchor. Ah, oh, it's a word we think we know. Surrender. Surrender? Yeah, surrender. Can you see this in the back? Move up. Surrender. What does it mean? What does it mean for us today? And again, I could have preached some really fiery message today. I want to preach a message that's going to keep your fire going. I don't want to just excite you just to excite you. I want you to hear the word. Surrender, you can also call it release. Look, there was a centurion on that boat. He had a hundred of his armed Roman soldiers. I told you at one point they actually chained Paul to the mast. They actually strapped him to the mast during the voyage, but not now. Now... They're surrendered to Paul and his God, along with all the rest. They're listening to Paul. How did Paul get into that spot? How can he get in the spot when 276 people are focused on everything he says? They're surrendered to him. Let me tell you about the Niagara plungers for a moment, as we weave this back and forth, who go over the falls. If, and that's a big if, if they make it and they live, the Ottawa police immediately arrest them on the river, find them $25,000 and put them in month, uh, month, 30 days in jail. They have to surrender as soon as it happens. Williams Booth's secret to success from the Salvation Army. He was once asked to reveal it. After some hesitation, tears came to his eyes and he said, I'll tell you the secret. God has had all the, there was of me. There have been men with greater brains than I have, men with greater opportunities, but from the day that I got poor, the poor of London on my heart and caught a vision of what Jesus could do with them, on that day I was made up my mind that God should have all of William Booth there was. It was this which led Dr. Wilbur Chapman, the questionnaire, to remark, I learned from William Booth that the greatest of man's power is the measure of his surrender. Let me tell you about surrender. When I first got saved, my father had been dead since I was 12 years old. I had never cried. After that happened, I never cried. I cried for almost a whole year when I was 12 years old, and then I didn't cry. I got extremely hard. And then one day, when Cheryl, who is not my wife, invited me to her church, I came up, I don't know why, but I felt something. And I laid in front of that altar and I cried my eyes out. I surrendered. Everybody else left and I just surrendered. You know what's wrong sometimes in churches? We don't surrender. What happened to the altar? We call people up at the altar all the time. What happened to the altar? What happened to hot tears of, of, of joy or hot tears of surrendering to God? What happened to bowing and be posh, prostrate to God? You know why? Because we want instant gratification. We want a message and we want to go back out and that's it. We want to go along with our life. Your life is starting and ending right here. Your life is going to get hope and surrender right here. Your life is going to get faith right here. You got to get to a point where you say, man, this is for me. I got to get to that altar. I got to surrender today. As I told, taught this message in the first service, I saw a man right here, a very stately man, probably about six foot tall, really a good looking guy, was up there and I came over and I saw him and there were tears, hot tears coming down his face. Let me tell you something. When was the last time you cried in church? Men? Oh, men don't cry. Really? Sissies don't cry. Oh, sissies do cry. No. Sissies do, don't cry. How do I know that? Because sissies want to appear a certain way. Men cry. Real men cry. Let me take you back to the birth of your first child, men. Let me take you back to that hospital room when you saw a life come. Let me tell you the first thing you did was you cried. Probably because you knew college was coming, but you cried. <laughs> did you not? You were overwhelmed with emotion. 
Do you know that Jesus births people in here every Sunday? Did you know every Sunday they're coming out of the womb of sickness and death and he's birthing them? We had salvations this morning. Can we cry over salvation of someone? Or have we got so closed in that we only see our own lives? I'm going to make an altar call. Not yet. I have another two hours. <laughs> but when I do, I'm going to call people. I'm going to call men up and women to just tarry at an altar for a moment. Ask yourself a question. When's the last time you came up to an altar call? When's the last time you came up and it didn't matter who was around you, but your tears came out because you love God and you, you understood that, man, my life has to serve. He has to be Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Come on. You can't just make him Lord on a Sunday. And I, and I know I'm talking to the choir. But listen, you may be here today and think that, well, I did my duty coming to church. You're not doing anybody a duty. You come to church to get something. Maybe the best thing you can get is a little emotion. When you surrender, what do you, why do you think we raise our hands? It's not because we're nuts. Not every church raises their hands. Why do we raise our hands? Because we're surrendering. I surrender. My kids are here, some of my children are here today. They'll remember, they'll remind me of when I used to, when I used to, when I was young, and I would get all excited about the Lord and preaching, and even in singing, mostly in singing, I would do what they called the Holy Ghost hop. <laughs> Sometimes I cross my leg. I'm going to pay for this later. <laughs> I was excited. Why was I excited? Because all of my body is surrendered to God. He's got my arms. He's got my heart. He's got my head. He's got my legs. He's got my family. He's got everything. I want to surrender it all. God, it's all yours, God. Listen, in the, Old in the New Testament said you've got to give everything up. Jesus isn't asking you to give all your money up. He's asking to give all of you up. Everything you have, your children, your family, your income, everything you have. God, this is yours. You bless it. Come on. It's called surrender. Check yourself. When was the last time you surrendered at an altar? I got to go quickly. Listen, there's a difference between commitment and surrender. What's the difference? When you make a commitment, you're still in control. No matter how noble the thing you commit to. You can commit to praying, to studying your Bible, to give, mo give his money, which is great. Or to commit to an automobile, pay automobile payments or to lose weight. Whatever he chooses you to do, to commit to. But surrender is different. If someone holds a gun and asks you to lift your hands in the air as a token of surrender, you don't tell that person that you're committed to, I'm committed to you. No, you simply surrender. You hold your hands up and you surrender. When was the last time you did that? So often our nights of soul torments are prolonged because we insist on holding on to the problem with one hand while we reach out to the Lord with the other hand. Listen, never hold on to anything tighter than you hold on, holding on to God. God didn't remove the Red Sea. He opened it up. He'll help us find a way through the, our problems as well. And don't tell God you've got a big problem. Tell your problem you've got a big God. These pastors have counseled, I've counseled. Pastor Terry does more than any one of us. Now, I'm sure he's heard people saying, oh man, Pastor Terry, this is tough. It's a hard thing. It's, and I understand, it's relative to them. I understand that. But what would, he, what would happen if he said, well, I can't help you. Go your own way and you'll get over it. No, he's going to give the compassion, the love, and, and the surrender of God. He's going to pray that prayer. He's going to tell them things. He's going to let them know that they can surrender. He's going to understand them. That's what God wants to do too. He uses agents to do it, but he wants to do it. Surrendering to God. You still with me this morning? You ready for me to quit? Pastor said, in order for me to earn my pay, I have to stay here for three hours. Listen. Lastly this morning... There's the anchor of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. This is what Paul says. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now I'm going to get down and gritty with you. Did you know that there came to a point in my life that I had to thank God for having cancer? I had to thank Him. It kind of sounds done, doesn't it? I had to thank Him. God, thank you for allowing cancer. He didn't give it to me. The enemy did. But thank you for allowing me to have it. You know why? I realized he trusted me yes. in still praising him while I had cancer. What problem do you have that you say, oh God, why me? Why am I going through this, God? Do you know what God's done? Your problems are there. Whatever it is, it could be different from you. God trusts you with it. Right. He trusts that your faith is going to grow with it. And sometimes our problems have a tendency to pull us down. God's, God's banking on the fact that your faith is going to bring you through. Let me give you an example. Amen. Job. 
It's kind of interesting. Satan was going through the world seeing who would serve God and he couldn't find anybody. He said, you know, I've gone all through the world. You know what God said? Have you considered my servant Job? Well, thanks a lot, God. I want to give you a great big thank you on that one. He missed me and you pointed me out. God said, you can touch everything he has, but you cannot take his life. Your life's in God's hands. Your family's in God's hands. Listen, he trusts you. If you're going through a problem today, and yours are different than mine, your path to, to God is totally different than mine. If you're going through a problem today, you have to use the same trust I do, and you have to thank him before the answer comes. Don't miss it. Anybody can thank him after the answer comes. Anybody can thank him once they, win, once they win this much money or somebody gives them money. I hope you're not winning it through the lottery, but anybody can thank him. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, well, if I win a million dollars in the lottery, would you take some as a tie to Mark Rail Ministries? I said, no. I was passing a casino up in, up in Niagara Falls and uh, I heard some per person say, hey, are you going to go in? I said, well, what good is that going to do? If I, if I win two million dollars, who am I going to tell? <laughs> you're not going to be excited about it, are you? Listen to me. It's a gamble to trust anything except God with your outcome. Anyone can praise and rejoice and thank God when things are going well for them or they succeed. I love coming to this church. You're great praisers and you're great worshipers, but I have to believe that you don't just praise Him in here. Can you secure your soul by throwing out the anchor of thanksgiving when there doesn't seem to be anything to thank Him for? Can you do it? Can you thank Him right now with all your troubles? People have come in here with trials. They did this morning in the first service. Let me ask a question. How many of you are going through something right now? I don't know what it is, but you're going through. Raise your hand. Can you thank him right now? Anybody can complain. You, are not, never, you and I are never free of Satan's onslaught, of his torments and trials of the problems of life. He doesn't take vacations. He has no sick days piled up, and he never gets weary of wearying you. But thanking the Lord in advance of a solution breaks the bondage of worry for me. Let me repeat it. Thanking the Lord in advance of a solution breaks the bondage from worry for me. When I, everybody else was thinking I was going to die, including all the professionals, Cheryl was thanking God for my, my life. I, would, I listened to her and it was like, what are you doing, Cheryl? I want to prepare you for my death. I sold all my motorcycles. I had, I don't know, probably about 15 motorcycles. Sold them all so she wouldn't get caught with them. I started skinny everything down. I started preparing. You know what I said to her one day, Pastor? She was at my bedside. Was, they were giving up on me. And I said, uh, Cheryl, I want you to know you'll laugh again. Man, she wanted to take my head off. I said, once I'm gone, you'll laugh again. She says, you're not going anywhere. I love her tenacity. Listen to me. You and I are never free of Satan's onslaught. But thanking the Lord in advance. She would, I, heard her, I would hear her in the bathroom thanking God for my life. There was no proof that I was going to live physically. She was thanking him. Thanking him for a solution that breaks the bondage of worry. Want proof? Look what Paul does after those anchors are tossed out says, and the, as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, they wanted to get on the dinghy, they wanted to get on the uh, lifeboat, had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow. So they were under pretense. They said, well, we're just going to move the anchors a little bit. What they were actually doing was trying to escape. Listen, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless you, these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. It's kind of amazing to me when you see this thing happening. I just gave you four spiritual anchors to throw out in times of despair. Hope, faith, hope. Those are two of the ones that started out. As you see faith and hope, they run together. Then as you get past faith and hope, you have surrender and thanksgiving. All of those come together and they anchor you down. Even, if, even though your life may be shipwrecked, even though your life may feel like it's falling apart, it seems they anchor you down and you have to wait on God because God's going to come through. Notice the first thing Luke tells us after the anchors were thrown out. Notice what happens here. It says that the sailors didn't trust the anchors. They tried to lower the lifeboat and escape. It's called doing things your own way, getting impatient. 36, it says, oh, 33, it says, and when day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you've continued in suspense and without food having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread and giving thanks to God in the presence of all the... He broke it and he began... He had communion 
before they got to shore, before they were saved. He was thanking God before it happened. Listen, it's a key to your life. It's a key to your anchors. It's a key to your salvation. Thanksgiving before the problem is solved. Oh, come on. It's a key to Christian victory. Then they all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Everything else was gone. All they wanted to do was praise God. It's here we learn that there are 276 people on board. That's a lot of folks. Paul said that God told him none of them would die and none did die. As for Niagara Falls, we did view Niagara Falls quite a bit. As a matter of fact, we actually survived going over it. <laughs> Acts 27 and 28. If you read it, it gives us four clues to these where those anchors were lowered in 60 AD. One, it was by a beach. Two, a reef with a sandbar who, where two seas met. Three, the seabed was about 90 feet deep sounding. Four, a place where sailors did not recognize. So in my, so in my studies, in May of 2015, biblical archaeologists, yes, them again, and amazingly, they did something. They found these, Paul's anchor from his ship. How do we know that? Because it's from a ship of Alexandria that's stamped on it. It's around the same year of 60 AD, and it's found in a certain place that was just described in those four in incidents. Amazingly, they found, it used to look like that. The wood would go through it. That's disintegrated. They found all four of them. They found all four anchors. Have you found your anchors today? Have you found them? Are you willing to pull them up to the surface and claim them? These are the anchors they found. Let me tell you, these anchors were massive. They were huge, and so are the ones I showed you. They found them up here. It's actually the spot they found. It's called St. Thomas Bay. It, it uh, definitely fits all the four criteria. It's also called today Paul's Bay, St. Paul's Bay. Here's Pope Benedict dedicating one of the anchors. They're huge. They're massive. Listen, have you been blown off course in life? You feel that some things are shipwrecked. Maybe it's a wayward son or a daughter. You feel it's not out of control. Are you looking for rescue today? I want you to understand. Maybe it could be a sudden loss of your job or an unexpected major bill or a surprise diagnosis of a serious illness or a spouse who just up and left after years of marriage or a close family member who has died or anything else that may arise and put you in dire straits. Or maybe it's just thinking about the future that taunts us so many times. I'm here to tell you that the anchor holds. But it was in the night the storms of my life oh that's where God proved his love to me the anchor holds though the ship is battered the anchor holds though the sails are torn I have fallen on my knees as I face the raging seas the anchor holds in spite of the storm would you bow your heads for me for a moment I told you I wanted to give you this message so that you can have something to hold on to if you and I dare say this if you take these anchors seriously if you pull them up to your life I promise you, I promise you, you'll be able to go through anything in life. No matter what happens, no matter what the devil throws your way, no matter what comes upon you, no matter how bad you think you have it, let me tell you something. The anchor holds. Faith. There's some people here today that maybe your faith is weak. Maybe you've been trusting and trusting and trusting, but it's weakening. Pull the anchor back up. Pull the anchor back up. Throw it out. And let it go out, let it go out and catch the solid rock. What about hope? There's some people here that you need to set that anchor hard in the ground of Jesus Christ and hope in Him. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Surrender. Men, have you surrendered? When's the last time you cried in a church? When's the last time you cried? When's the last time you just put your arms around your wife and you told her, I want to pray for you and the family? When's the last time you came up and you just laid in front of God on an altar? Oh, we're just sophisticated. Now we wear suits. We don't want to, we don't want to ruin our clothes. Thanksgiving, some of you are going through some things that's a personal hell right now and I don't even know it. You do. Can you thank him for it? Thank you, God. I know you gave this to me because you trust me. Because you're counting on me to give you praise no matter what happens. You're counting on me, God. And I don't want to fail you. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. We've been talking in the last two months about the fire, fanning the flame. I just fanned the flame as much as I possibly could right now, telling you the rest of your life, no matter how much time we have left, those four anchors will hold. They will grip the solid rock. And you will be strong. You will be an overcomer. You will be a conqueror. You'll be more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. Would you all stand with me for a moment? In a moment, we're going to sing that song. But before we do that, let me ask you a question. Are you ready? Are you ready to, to uh, do more than commitment today? 
to surrender. One day John Wesley was rocking with a troubled man who expressed his doubt about the goodness of God. He said, I do not know that I, what I shall do with all this worry and trouble that I have. At that moment, the same moment, Wesley saw a cow looking over a stone wall. Do you know, asked Wesley, why that cow is looking over that wall? No, said the man who was worried. Wesley said, the cow is looking over the wall because she can't see through it. That's what you must do with all your wall of trouble. Look over it and avoid it. God knows it's there. Faith enables us to look past our circumstances and focus on God. This morning, I'm not going to ask you to bow your heads. I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes. I'm going to ask this. Who would be among us today and say, man, Pastor Mark, I need to get serious with God. I have never been saved, or maybe if I was saved when I was a child and I'm just not walking for him. Would you raise your hand? Would you be brave enough to raise your hand? Let me tell you something. Your ship is, pull is pulling apart at the seams, and you need him a hand way up there. Where else? You'll raise your hand and say, this is me, Pastor. I came here, and this is the message that I needed for my salvation. Where else is there a hand? Maybe you're a Christian. You've been a Christian a long time. But maybe your flame is flickering. Maybe church sometimes doesn't do it for you. But the Word of God will. The Word of God will always do it for you. You're ready to commit yourself to God and say, I want to rededicate my heart, my heart to God. Would you raise your hand? Come on, raise that hand up high. You know who you are. Thank you, Jesus. Right over here. Where else? Thank you, Lord God. Where else? Another hand over there. Another one over here. In a moment, I'm going to call you all up. I'm not going to embarrass anyone, but I'm going to call some other people first. There are some people here that you need the anchor of faith. Your faith's been wavering. I'm not going against you. All of our faith wavers at times. But you need to set the anchor today. Some of you have lost hope. Maybe it's in a child that's gone so far away from God that you don't even hope anymore. Get it back. Maybe it's surrendering. Men, let me talk to you. Be a real man. Be a real man. Jesus wept. Shortest verse in scripture. He wept. It means he groaned in his spirit and it came out through his emotion when Lazarus had died. Thanksgiving, some of you have some, some serious problems. I can't wave a wand and let those problems go away. As a matter of fact, I'm probably not supposed to wave a wand to let them go away. But we're supposed to thank Him through that. So this morning, I'm going to ask if you need any of that or all of it to come up to this altar. This is your opportunity. Come on up. Just come out of your seat and come up. I want to pray for you. Come on. Lots of you coming up. Come on. Be very sure. Sing it with us. Come on up here. Come on. Don't wait. Come on. One moment. I'm not going to keep you long. Come on. that's left in your seats to come up and be an encouragement to these. Would you come out of your seat? Come up and just support some of these today. There's always time for Jesus. So this morning, as I was closing as an altar call and praying for people, the Lord starts speaking to me. And uh, I never know when that's coming, Pastor. I know you don't either. But it's coming again. There's a man here. You are so depressed. And you know, we don't like to show our emotions. You're so depressed that you are lower than low. And basically, this is your release today. If that's you, and I'm going to do this because I trust it. If that's you today, I'm going to raise your hand. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand right here. Listen, gather around him and pray. Just gather around him and pray. God's speaking to us today. There's someone here you're worried about your children. 
You are worried where they are at school. You're worried about what, who their friends are. And you're seriously worried. This isn't just an occasional type of thing. You're really worried. You're starting to see some patterns in their lives. And something down the line is bothering you really bad. And you're not sure what to do with it. Who is that today? Right over here. Would you gather around her and pray for her right now? Just gather around her and pray for her right now. All right. I'm going to tell you this one. You may not raise your hand, but that's okay. There's a man here you've been in church for a long time. But you know and I know that you just don't get it. You don't get it. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about you don't get all the excitement of it. You don't get the fact that you got to throw everything into God. You don't get it. you got friends in the world, and sometimes when you're there, even though you love God, and even though every now and then you'll speak to them, they have an influence on you. And you're ready to say, draw a line in the sand and say, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going to surrender everything I have to God. Now, if you're brave enough to raise your hand, I want you to do it right now. Right there. Would you pray for him? Pray for him right now. Right here. Pray for him right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Can you pray with me today? God is among us today. Father, I thank you today. I thank you, Lord God, for your power. I thank you for your presence here today, Lord God. I'm thankful, Lord God, that we have faith in you. Faith, Lord God, to move mountains. I'm thankful for the hope that you've given us, Lord God. Lord, the hope in the blessed assurance that you give us. Lord, I am thankful today, Lord God. Lord, I bow down before you for that, Lord Jesus. For the surrender that we have, Lord God, as men are surrendering today. Lord, may they surrender women surrendering their families, Lord God, their very plans, Lord God. And Lord, we thank you. Even for the terrible things we're going through, we thank you, Lord God. We're done complaining. We want to thank you in everything. Give thanks. For this is your will in Christ Jesus concerning us, Lord God. Come on, sing it to him this morning. Raise your voice. Come on, praise him this morning. Raise your voice. Touch, O oh God, as only you can, Lord. In Jesus' name, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Touch, Lord God, as only you can, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Very sure. Your anchor. said something about me so I'm gonna have to say something about him these relate these relationships don't happen they don't happen let me tell you something that probably none of you know and he's gonna be embarrassed by it when I had when I had cancer and I was sick I never met Pastor Randy never met him I was sick and I was in the hospital ready to die and he was led to take an offering for me in this church he never knew me didn't know me at all heard of me but didn't know me he called up my son who's here today to come and and uh, collect the offering. When Mark came in, he, he and Pastor Randy cried. They cried over me. And Mark came to me with tears and said, Dad, you will not believe this man. Your fan right there. And I can't believe it, to be honest with you. God has given us such a love for each other. And you know what? That doesn't happen in the ministry. It's just, I've been all over, you've been all over. It doesn't. They're competitive. It's unfortunate. But our love for each other, I believe, is extended to our love for you. Right. I am so thankful that God spared my life and his for such a time as this. Don't take it for granted. Trust God. Love God. And by the way, some of the folks that went with us, raise your hands. They were, go ahead, raise them up high. The Nixes, they were in the barrel with us in, the, in Niagara Falls. So I want to thank them for coming today. Would you thank God and give a hand to Pastor Randy? I love you, buddy. You're awesome. I love you, buddy. Thank you. No matter what you face, no matter where you go, that anger Amen. Amen. is strong, is secure. Amen. What a powerful message today. Thank you, Jesus. Don't forget. Stand strong. Hey, baby. Be the leader of God and God's calling. Amen. 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 We'll say this before. Love you, Vicky. We have a great thing here. God has blessed us. 
Amen. 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 Some of those people that's giving you the biggest fits out there, the reason they are is because they don't have what you That's right. That's right. That's right. So just remember in this battle that you're in. Thank you, Jesus. You wrestle not against flesh and blood. Amen. 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 But the enemy is trying his best to destroy lives. Well, let me tell you something. I told you the day that I came here, you've had better preachers, you've had better teachers, you've had better administrators. You ain't never had nobody love you. Amen. 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 I can do it from here by myself. But if you feel comfortable with doing so, reach over and give that person beside you a hug and just tell them, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. I love you. I love you. I love you.